Hello everyone, and welcome back to Anthropology 201 World Cultures. This is the sixth and final lecture series in this course. The topic of lecture series six is applied anthropology. Now, throughout this course, we have explored different cultures and examined the different areas that make up these cultures. So, for this next section, we will be discussing the position of the anthropologist and how we, as anthropologists, apply what we have observed and learned towards the advancements and understandings of different areas. So, cultural anthropology research involves living people. We've come to know this throughout this semester. Now, it involves living people and sharing in their lives, and this often involves befriending them. Now, this act of befriending them is a tricky subject. On the one hand, if you want somebody to open up and share everything that it means to be them and part of their society, which this is the main goal of cultural anthropology, then you're going to have to be their friend. But the downside to this is that it makes it difficult for anthropologists to ignore the enormity of the problems societies face every day. Now, some of these problems that anthropologists encounter are poor health and living conditions, inadequate food, lack of drinking water, high infant mortality, political repression, and all of these can make anthropologists feel a sense of responsibility for helping to solve, or at the very least, identify the social problems. Now, all this being said, anthropologists have always applied their findings to the solution of human problems, at least to some extent they have. Now, those anthropologists who have put their research and expertise into practice to help solve these social problems are conducting applied anthropology. Now, applied anthropology is characterized by problem oriented research among the world's contemporary populations. So applied anthropology attempts to apply anthropological data, concepts, and strategies to the solutions of social, economic, environmental, and technological problems. Now, some examples of this are lowering the incidence of obesity in certain segments of populations, or improving conflicts between police and immigrant populations in urban areas, or developing economic opportunities in third world communities. Now, in recent times, applied anthropology has been referred to as many different things, such as action anthropology, advocacy anthropology, developmental anthropology, and practicing anthropology. Now, much of the applied anthropology carried out in the recent decades has been supported by large public and private organizations. Now, these organizations are often seeking to better understand the cultural dimensions of their sponsored programs. Now, these organizations include international agencies, such as the U.S. Agency for International Development, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, uh, the, Food, the, the uh, Ford Foundation, and the Population Council. Now, it also includes national organizations, such as the National Institutes of Health or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you got the, the CDC, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it even goes so much as to come down to local levels of organization. Uh, there's various hospitals, private corporations, uh, school systems. Uh, you, you also see anthropologists coming into urban planning departments and substance abuse programs, or uh, facilities for the aged and family planning clinics. 
Now each one of these, from the international to the national to the local scale, have all utilized applied anthropology to better their organizations. Now, so for much of the past century, many anthropologists have distinguished from applied to non-applied anthropology. So non-applied anthropology, or sometimes referred to as descriptive or academic anthropology, is seen as being concerned only with the advancement of the discipline in terms of refining its methods and theories and adding more valid, reliable data. It's, it's concerned with you know, knowledge for knowledge's sake. Now, applied anthropology, on the other hand, is characterized by being primarily aimed at changing human behavior in order to improve modern problems. So, applied anthropology is considerably more difficult to define than the four traditional subfields. Mainly, this is because it has always been a part of the discipline. In fact, applied and theoretical anthropology have developed alongside each other. So, anthropologists with applied interests were involved in shaping the professional organizations from the beginning. Now, to illustrate this point, let us look at the American Anthropological Association. From its founding in 1902, the AAA, which is today's largest professional organization of anthropologists, was linked to the Anthropological Society of Washington. Now, the Anthropological Society of Washington was founded in 1879, many, many years before the American Anthropological Association. Now, this organization helped organize applied research on inequalities in low-income housing in Washington. Now, this was going on during the 19th century. Now, also, some of the major subfields of cultural anthropology evolved out of early applied research, including political, urban, medical, agricultural, educational, and environmental anthropology. Now, on top of all of this, the first code of ethics for the profession of anthropology was established by the Society for Applied Anthropology in 1949. While the American Anthropological Association did not follow with its own code until 1971. Thus, we can see applied anthropology has played a key role in shaping the entire discipline of anthropology. Now, unlike theoretical or academic anthropology, the work of applied anthropology involves generating three major products. First is information, then policy, and finally action. The first of these products is the collection of solid sociocultural information on the people under study or the project participants. So, I'll repeat that. Information, that's the first of our three major products, is the collection of solid sociocultural information on the people under study or the project participants. So, this information can be obtained by conducting researches, or by conducting research, which includes the gathering of raw data and data that has been analyzed as well as general anthropological theories. Now, using these research findings as a foundation, the applied anthropologist next develops policy. Now, policy
policy can be used to help alleviate a problem or condition identified during the information gathering phase. Although anthropologists may be involved in, pol in the policy making process, it typically more likely that they will just hand their data off to somebody else and the policymakers will then make the policy while sometimes consulting back and forth. Now, the final product of the applied anthropologist is a plan of action or intervention. Now, this is designed to correct the problem or undesirable condition. So, in other words, information is obtained through research, information is used to formulate policy, and policy guides action. Now, there are some special features of anthropology. So, what does the discipline of anthropology have to offer as an applied social science? So, what unique contributions can anthropology make to social programs and agencies? The unique approach to the study of humans that anthropology has offers six features that set itself apart from other social sciences. First is participant observation. This is direct field observation. It is a hallmark of 20th century anthropology and can lead to a fuller understanding of socioculture. Also, the rapport developed while conducting participant observation research can be drawn upon in the implementation stage of the applied project. So you've been observing these people for a while. You, you get to know them. They get to know you. You build some trust. So when you identify this problem and you come back with a potential solution, you're their friend. They're more likely to listen to you. Next is the emic view. Whatever the setting of a particular project, be it jungle or urban, the applied anthropologist brings to the project the perspective of the local people. This is what anthropologists call the emic view. Now, by using the emic view rather than their own technical slash professional view or the etic view, anthropologists can provide program planners and administrators with strategic information that can seriously affect the outcome of programs of planned change. The next unique feature is the holistic perspective. Now, this distinctive feature of anthropology forces us to look at multiple variables and see human paw problems in their historical, economic, and cultural contexts. So this conceptual orientation reminds us that various parts of sociocultural systems are interconnected, and therefore a change in one part of the system is likely to cause changes in other parts. The next unique feature of anthropology is regional expertise. Many anthropologists, you know, despite recent trends towards specialization, continue to function as cultural area specialists, such as um, an Africanist or a Latin Americanist. So the cultural anthropologist who has conducted you know, doctoral research in Zimbabwe, for you know, for example, often returns to that country for subsequent field studies. So over time, you get this long-term association with a region, and, and that also in turn provides a depth of geographical knowledge that most policymakers lack. Uh, 
The next feature is cultural relativism. Now, the basic principle of cultural relativism tends to foster tolerance, which can be particularly relevant for applied anthropologists working in complex organizations. For example, tolerance stemming from the perspective of cultural relativism can help anthropologists cross class lines and relate to a wide range of people within these complex organizations, like schools or hospitals. The final unique feature of anthropology is topical expertise. It is generally recognized that the topical knowledge gleaned from fairly specific anthropological studies in one part of the world is likely to have policy relevance in other parts of the world. For example, cultural anthropologists who have studied pastoralism in East Africa have topical experience with and knowledge about pastoralism that can often be applied to many other pastoralist communities around the world. Now, these six features of anthropology enhance the discipline's effectiveness in developing programs, projects, and policies that contribute to, you know, alleviating contemporary social problems. Now, applied anthropologists also play a number of specialized roles. You often see them as policy researchers, evaluators, impact assessors, planners, and, and the list goes on and on. So we're going to take a look at some of the more specialized roles that anthropologists find themselves in. So the first one we're going to start with is a policy researcher. So this role which is perhaps the most common role for applied anthropologists, involves providing cultural data to policymakers so that they can make the most informed policy decisions. Uh, next up on our specialized role list is evaluator. So this one is also quite common for anthropologists. Evaluators use their research skills to determine how well a program or policy has succeeded in fulfilling its objectives. Our next specialized role is called the Impact Assessor. This role entails measuring the effects of a particular project, program, or policy on local peoples. For example, an Impact Assessor may determine the consequences, both intended and unintended, that a federal highway construction project might have for the community through which the highway runs. And this specialized role often directly relates to our next one, which is a planner. And this too is a fairly common role for applied anthropologists. And they often, for this role, they actively participate in the design of various programs and policies. Next up is Needs Assessor. This role involves conducting research to determine ahead of time the need for a proposed program or project. Now, this often coincides with our first one, which is the policy research. So many times the specialized role will not just be one or the other, you'll kind of have a mixing of one or two or three of these. Uh, next up on our list is trainer. Now, adopting what is essentially a teaching role, the applied anthropologist imparts cultural knowledge about certain populations to different professional groups working in cross-cultural situations. Uh, so you often see this as, uh, you know, the Peace Corps volunteers or international business people. So these people will come in and 
uh, they're typically hired by large projects, project managers to come in and you know, say, okay, we've got a big deal going on in this other country, you know, what are the do's and the don'ts for this particular culture? And these applied anthropologists come in as trainers and they tell them, they coach them, they, you know, teach them you know, what is accepted amongst this group and what is not. Next up on our list is the advocate. Now, this role is very rare and involves becoming an active supporter of a particular group of people. Uh, and th this usually involves political action. And this role is most often combined with other roles. Uh, next up is our expert witness. So this role involves the presentation of culturally relevant research findings as part of judicial proceedings uh, through legal briefs, depositions, or even direct testimony. Uh, next on our list of specialized roles are the administrator or manager. Now, applied anthropologists who assume direct administrative responsibility for a particular project is working in this specialized role. It's face value. It's exactly what it sounds like. So our last specialized role that we're going to look at is the cultural broker. Now this role may involve serving as a liaison between the program planner and the administrators on one hand and local ethnic communities on the other hand. Or you might often see this between uh, you know, mainstream hospital personnel and their uh, ethnically distant patients. Now, these specialized roles, you know, be it uh, expert witness, cultural broker, planner, policy researcher, whatever, are not mutually exclusive. In many cases, applied anthropologists play two or more of these roles as part of the same job. So, the next section of this lecture, I have included two examples of applied anthropology. The first involves uh, urban anthropology, and the second involves medical anthropology. Now, both of these are prime examples of how anthropological research is you know, applied in you know today's uh, society, how it's used in the career form as opposed to the academia form. So first up is urban anthropology. Now this one was an ethnographic study of adolescent drug dealers. So because of cocaine's high cost, cocaine addiction historically has been viewed as a rich person's problem. And in the last several decades, however, the introduction of a cheaper variety of cocaine crack has been made the drug uh, has made this drug accessible to all segments of the population now by and large the appearance of crack cocaine has been a destructive force for both individuals and society as a whole now increased trafficking in crack cocaine has been responsible you know at least in part for increases in crime in the incidences of HIV and AIDS uh, and in the number of children born with drug addictions. So one of the more disturbing aspects of the crack cocaine epidemic is the high incidence of cocaine dealing among adolescents. Now this study took place in uh, between 2008 and 2010. So 
when this first started in 2008, there were 5.3 million Americans aged 12 and older who have abused cocaine in any form. And 1.1 million had abused crack at least once uh, in the year prior to being surveyed. So, this is not a new problem, but it is clearly an increasing problem. So, in an attempt to learn more about adolescent drug dealers, uh, Richard Dimbo and his colleagues conducted an ethnographic study of adolescent drug dealers in West Central Florida. Dimbo in interviewed 34 drug dealing youths and 16 non-drug dealing youths on topics such as the extent to which they used income from selling drugs to help meet family expenses, um, their reasons for selling crack, and the perceived risks of dealing in cocaine and the negative effects of drug trafficking on the neighborhood. So, the adolescents who were dealing needed to work on average 21 weeks out of the year. Most of the dealers said that they were not currently using cocaine. Two out of three adolescent dealers said that they had killed or hurt someone through their association with cocaine. Now, the great majority of the dealers reported that they spent most of their income on personal luxury items, such as, you know, clothing or jewelry, or on business expenses, such as guns or protection. And it is estimated that they contributed less than 10% of their income to their families. So most adolescent dealers said that they sold cocaine to earn a lot of money because legitimate jobs pay too little, which gives them higher status amongst their peers. So this ethnographic study of the culture of adolescent cocaine dealers has important policy implications because the findings suggest that certain strategies for dealing with this problem. For example, because wanting to make money is the major reason for selling cocaine, intervention strategies must include ways of improving the vocational and educational skills of adolescents so that they will have more access to legitimate work. So because most of the adolescent dealers were not using cocaine, there is little reason to treat the problem as drug dependency. So this study suggests that the adolescent dealing is motivated by economics and not drug addiction. So. Knowing this fact about the culture of adolescent drug dealers suggests a rational strategy for addressing the problem. So, former teenage dealers who have been successful in legitimate careers could serve as a positive role model for adolescent dealers by encouraging and supporting those who are willing to pursue legitimate career alternatives. So. Our next example of applied anthropology comes from the medical field. So, the Nestle baby formula controversy. So, as we have mentioned, one of the roles of applied anthropologists play is advocate. So, whereby one's own research is used to support a public cause or protest movement. Penny Von Estrich was an applied anthropologist from York University in Toronto and played such a role during the late 1970s and early 1980s in the controversy surrounding Nestle's active marketing of baby formula in impoverished third world countries. So, because increasing numbers of new mothers in the US and Europe 
were choosing breastfeeding rather than bottle feeding during this time. Nestle, a major manufacturer of baby formula, aggressively marketed its products to third world mothers in an effort to increase the company's worldwide market share. So opponents of Nestle argued that the company's aggressive marketing in third world countries was highly irresponsible because of the health risks that the formula posed to infants and the risks associated with not breastfeeding. The major problem was that the formula needed to be mixed with clean, potable water, which in many third world countries is in short supply. So, moreover, the fuel needed to boil the local water to remove contaminants was often unavailable or unaffordable. Thus, more often than not, children in Africa, Asia, and South America were being fed overly diluted formula made with contaminated water. So this result was marked, uh, was a marked increase in infant uh, illness and mortality due to diarrhea, dehydration, and intestinal infections. So the scientific evidence supported the superiority of breastfeeding over infant formula because breast milk is safe. It's renewable and it's free. So, nevertheless, Nestle, as well as some American and European companies, persisted in promoting its products to third world mothers for more than a decade. So, this spurred on by the widespread international protests, the World Health Organization and UNICEF developed the Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes in 1981. They did this to ensure the ethical marketing of all baby foods. Interestingly, the United States was the only country that refused to endorse the guidelines owing to its insistence on unregulated worldwide trade. The protests, debates, and boycotts lasted until 1984 when Nestle finally agreed to comply with the internationally agreed upon guidelines. So because of poor compliance, the boycott continues in many countries. Now, throughout this period, when Nestle seemed to be thumbing its nose at the rest of the world, applied anthropologist von Estrich played an important advocacy role in the debate. Having conducted fieldwork in Thailand, she brought her research on the uh, deleterious health effects of baby formula to the public debate on this issue. She participated in a large-scale research project on the topic in Colombia, Kenya, Indonesia, and Thailand. And on many occasions since the late 1970s, she, she has participated in public debates on the topic, some of which involved official Nestle spokespersons. Thus, Von Estrick provides an excellent example of the role of advocacy in which the applied anthropologist not only conducts research on a controversial topic, but also takes the next step of directly advocating a particular position in the public debate. So, this concludes Lecture Series 6. Thank you all very much, and as always, let's all try and make better mistakes tomorrow.